Welcome back to the Zero to Zero podcast. I am your host, Danny Duma. Producer Carl is in the house. How are you doing, buddy? Good. How are you, Danny? Uh, I am good. Thanks, Carl, for speaking up. We usually can't hear you in most of the episodes. <laughs> uh, a little intro to, into our guest tonight. I'm really excited. He uh, shot me a very long bio email and uh, <laughs> picked and kind of picked out my favorite little parts, and we're going to explore them all today. He's got a very... Uh, extensive knowledge in the marketing branding world and I'm excited to kind of dive into it. He is uh, worked a long time for Roots, a clothing company that was with the Olympics for a long time and uh, now is the owner of his uh, own business, Patterson Brands. Uh, Welcome to the show. How you doing? Thanks, Danny. I'm good. Good. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Uh, Rich, you mentioned in your email, usually if you've listened to a couple of the podcasts, I start by asking people to describe themselves in a few words. Instead tonight, I'm going to pick the two things that you mentioned in your, uh, emails and, uh, I can guess what they're going to let, be. <laughs> let's just kind of explore them a little bit. Cause I feel like I'm very similar in those ways. And so we can just kind of dive into that. One is weird. Mm. You describe yourself as a weird human. Yeah, sure. Well, let's like, what, why, what makes you weird? Are people telling you you're weird or you're just like, Oh, I'm kind of different. No, it's the latter. I think I'm, I I feel that way sometimes. I I think people are generous. They don't walk up and say, God, you're weird, but I do get that vibe sometimes. And that's okay. I mean, you know, we're not, everyone's going to be everybody else's cup of tea. And I I think that's totally fine. I actually like that. What about you is weird? Uh, I think that sometimes I zig when others zag and I actually like to do that. Like I sometimes find I purposely do that. Um, I find my wife has been a tremendous influence on me that way. We've been together a long, long time and she's definitely, uh, like she likes to go the opposite route. And, uh, I, I probably, when I was younger, when we first met, I think I was much more conservative and conservative and sort of middle of the road. And, uh, she's been a great influence on me that way for sure. (laughs) She keeps you in line. Oh, for sure. Uh, cause I say it often that I'm, I'm just, I'm weird and I don't know where, the term weird comes from because I think it has a negative connotation, but I don't mean it negative. I just mean that the way that my mind works is different. And the way that I've figured that out is when people are asking me about business and work and stuff like that, it's always like, I literally have a thousand things going on. Here's a few things. If you want to know, do you want to know about real estate? Okay, great. We have, you know, 18 listings right now. We're blah, 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 blah. And they're like, you're insane. How do you do that? I'm like, I don't know any other way. Yeah. Cause I, it, it, I think it, it started in sport in terms of like work ethic and just always wanting to be doing something with me growing up and it's just translated into business. And I, I'm lucky enough to have found something very young. I started when I was 25 in real estate yeah, that I yeah. just absolutely love. And I just see so much growth potential and I'm excited about what it can become. Yeah. And I'm not willing to compromise the work ethic, how much time I put in now, because I can see the growth pattern as it's going. Well, you're young and you, you, you absolutely, you got so much time and energy. I, I really admire that. Yeah. I, I totally admire that. I find myself feeling so tired these days, Yeah. but uh, really I, I find a lot of my weirdness goes back to uh, high school, <laughs> high school when I was trying to avoid being pummeled by, I was, I had this, I was in this huge high school. And there was a lot of tough, tough dudes in that high school. And so uh, I had a couple of friends, my friend Futch and I were like the class clowns. Like that was our way. If we could make people laugh, awesome. Then you weren't getting beat up. And uh, yeah, I wasn't that I wasn't six foot four and 270 then. I wish I was because I wouldn't have needed the humor. <laughs> but uh, I was a lot smaller then and uh, chubby still, but uh, just a lot smaller. And uh, yeah, I, I just found that humor was so I still have this kind of quirky sense of humor. And often I find it just falls flat, but I it won't stop me from trying. It just won't <laughs> stop me from trying. You know, I'll try it out anytime. And sometimes I think that leads to a lot of a hmm, that guy's kind of odd, but that's okay. For some reason today, when I was thinking about the intro into the podcast tonight and bringing up the term weird and just kind of explaining it, for some reason, the idea of insecurity came in. And so I was kind of exploring that in my head as I was driving to an appointment today of where does this weirdness come from? Where does this mindset come from? Does it come from, for me, maybe being like a really shy kid and I had some insecurities that... um, got made fun of for and stuff like that. And I just figured out over time that I don't really care. Mm -hmm. Um, I am who I am. It works for me, 
But does that play in? Did that play I think into that's, it I think that's a very sharp point. And I, I know I still find myself sometimes and I'm all, I'm going to be 50 soon. I'm like 48 now. Uh, you know, my wife and I, we moved out to New Westminster only three years ago and, I, uh, yeah, three years ago, a little over three years. And I found myself when I was out here going to new, like, uh, community situations and business situations and not knowing people. And I, I found myself getting quite insecure and I was like, dude, like, come on, you, you got to get over it by now. Mm-hmm. And that's a funny thing. I'd honestly, I think in some situations you'd never get over it and that's okay. You know, I think that's okay. You got to give yourself room for that. And I did find myself sometimes doing these things. And I was like, man, that was weird. Why'd you do that? But I knew it was like, you just got nervous. Mm. You got nervous. And that's why I appreciate the opportunity to come here and do a thing like this today, because these kind of things are, I think you have to do these kind of things in, in life and in business to give yourself room to like grow your, like grow your, you know, grow yourself for sure. If you don't do this kind of stuff. So I, I, I applaud you and I thank you for the opportunity because I honestly, I I used to do a ton of things like this, like go on television and uh, just tons of stuff, talk to reporters and, but I haven't done a lot in the, so this is a great opportunity. The whole reason for me for starting the podcast was really just to, a couple of reasons. One, I learn best by talking to other like-minded business people who don't sacrifice. They're just like all in and hearing from their stories their experiences, how they grew businesses and overcame adversities. And so I, one, I wanted to share my story cause I think it's fairly unique and there's some value there for others starting businesses or young entrepreneurs out there, but two, to educate myself as well as listeners on other people's stories. Sure. And I think you've got a pretty, you've got a lot of experience just from the very brief, well, thorough email that you sent over. Uh, <laughs> But I think there's a lot in there to explore that will provide value to listeners. I hope and so. And so I'm excited to kind of dive into it. I hope so. I've done a lot of, you saw a lot of stuff and thankful. Like it's, uh, I don't know if I said this, I said a lot of stuff, but I always found the harder I work, the luckier I get. And damn, I've been awfully lucky and I've worked really, really hard. But every time I worked hard, I got lucky. So those two things seem to go together. Okay. Lucky. I want to talk about. Yeah. I'm making a quick note. The last, uh, the only other thing in terms of describing yourself, another thing you said is you've, you figured out that you really don't care what other people think. Mm. And was that something that was learned? Was that something that was a conscious thing that, um, maybe you, maybe like you just said, you found yourself feeling insecure in weird, different situations and not really understanding why, and just consciously saying, it really makes no difference to me what, what other people think. I just need to be myself. Yeah, no, definitely. And I think I shared with you my, my MacGruber story, my me, I, I, I was one of the first, one of the (laughs) only people I would ever imagine who graduated from university and said, I'm buying a Miata. Like it just seemed like a good idea at the time. But really, uh, this was my point was that I've made choice, conscious choice in my life for things where I was like, it's going to look kind of weird. This six foot four guy rolling down the highway. I remember one time being in, in on Vancouver Island with my friend Ed Bumbers and he played, Ed played defensive end for the Western Mustangs. He won, I think, two Vanier Cups with them. Like the dude was a monster. <laughs> and here's he and I in this tiny Mazda Miata rolling down the highway and we get a speeding ticket. And I thought the RCMP officer, she must have been like 30. We were 22 or something. I thought she was going to pee her pants she was laughing so hard because we were basically spilling out of the car like it we weren't in the uh, what's well, that we weren't in the cars like we were wearing the car yeah. we were so big but yeah that was just a situation where like I, I said i want this car it's gonna look so dumb me having it but who cares it's an awesome car like there, it was so fun and yeah. it's just one of those times where you had to do it Appear- yeah appearance wise it does look a bit dainty <laughs> yeah uh, I remember I had an aunt when I was a kid. I was like eight or 10. <laughs> Sorry not to rub it in, but, uh, and she had a Miata and I was like, it is a slick looking car. It's just very petite. Yeah. And it fit her because she was like five, one hundred and six pounds maybe. Yeah. And it like, it looked great on her and it was a convertible and it looked really good. But as a kid, maybe I thought, oh, that's a sweet car. But then I was like 16 and I looked at the car again and I was like, like no. I don't think I even fit in there. <laughs> no. <laughs> bad it's nice that your linebacker defensive end or whatever friend yeah. could fit yeah um so 
insecurity is a very interesting thing to me and I think about it a lot and how much it affects people. Yeah. And one thing I've figured out in the last couple of years is that if I make them public, the things that I don't like about myself or bug me about myself, if I make them public, I don't care about them as much. Mm. So whether it be through the podcast platform or through social media, if I'm honest with myself and just say like one of my biggest insecurities is I have a shitty hairline. It used to bug me a lot, but now that it's out there and I've said it so many times, yeah. I'm just like, ah, oh, it is what it is. I'm looking now, but <laughs> that's why we're had all the time now. <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> yeah, it's coming in bad. I'm 29. Well, I'm almost 30 actually. So yeah. is Carl. Jeez. If I had, we're getting old. Oh. <laughs> One thing I figured out and it's been in the last year or two maybe is that literally the age means absolutely nothing. It's mm. how you perceive yourself. And I just feel like I have so much energy and so much that I want to accomplish yeah. that I could be 70 and I'll still feel the exact same way that I am today. I think you will too. Maybe imagine, my back will hurt more. I don't know, but no, imagine if you, once you get to, I'm 48, almost feel like I'm going to be 50 any day now. And honestly, I, it's just like time stood still, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Like I, I see this meme online and it, this is, it totally speaks to me. I think it says something to the effect of when people say 30 years ago, I think of 1970 and that's exactly true for me. That's funny. Yeah. 30 years ago to yeah. me, it was 1970. Yeah. Okay, so that's why I'm sort of stuck, you know, and that's really what I think happens. You just, uh, you don't feel like 48. You feel like you're still in your mid thirties and you want to do all that kind of stuff. And so it's great. It's great. I never really feel old, but I joke about it a little bit sometimes. And one of some, somebody said something to me the other day and said, um, do you know that people born in 2000 are legally allowed to be able to drink this year? And I was like, man, that makes me feel old, <laughs> which is crazy. Yeah. I feel like someone born in 2000 is like six years old right now. Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. No, I, I can agree. Anyway. Uh, Okay, before we get into business, and obviously there's lots to talk about there, uh, Barbados. Mm. Barbados has a very warm spot in your heart. Absolutely. And I just came back from Barbados. First time in the Caribbean for me. Fabulous, right? Loved it. Yeah. Beaches, amazing. Like yeah. crystal clear turquoise water. <laughs> amazing. Uh, I was, I didn't really know what to expect going in in terms of like locals and feeling secure when you're yeah. walking around neighborhoods. Yeah friendliest people oh. in any country not that i've traveled a ton but i've been to maybe six countries in europe mexico a couple times and then north like through north america friendliest people I've, yeah. in any country or any city i've ever been totally agree same experience yeah absolutely they have a ton of affinity for canadians right they love canadians yeah right? uh you can go to like i went to my cibc i mean it's just a small thing but you can go to cibc bank yeah and go to the teller and just take money out it's the weirdest thing so they have canadian banks there they love canadians um, but that's besides the point the people are amazing just lovely and I, uh, we were there for a month and it was awesome and i was similar to you i really didn't know what to expect yeah. at all and again it, just like i've already alluded to my wife is like the super adventurous one i'm more a little bit more conservative so she was game for anything and i was quite nervous going there i'm like i don't know what to expect we're doing a home exchange so we're staying in some family's house we never met but it, it turned out great awesome yeah did, uh did you like the area that you're in yeah really yeah. like the area the only i was close by i was fitz village okay um which is like just south of whole town oh yeah yeah so the only thing i there wasn't a ton of amenities around. So we went into Bridgetown, which is like the main city there. Sure. And there was a lot to do. Yeah. A lot of sh like shopping and restaurants and bars and great beaches. Uh, that was the only thing that I would have maybe changed is location based so on what was more it, walkability. What was it like a rental house? What was the, yeah, we just did Airbnb yeah. across the street from the beach, which was fabulous. Yeah. Looked at a couple of resorts, but resorts are expensive. Oh, it's crazy expensive yeah. there. Crazy but, expensive. Like, so one of my goals in 2019, and there's a lot of them, uh, one of them is to do something physically active every single day yeah. of the year. So I ran every day there. Yeah. I ran by Rihanna's house. I yeah. went Sandy Lane every day. Oh. It was just kind of cool. So for like, whatever, 20 seconds as you're walking, as you're running by, you're just looking up and like not even knowing where you're going, but you're just looking at this yeah. building because it's spectacular. One, uh, one of the tour guides or uh, cab drivers or something, I can't remember, told us that there's eight units in there, I think. Mm. And the smallest one is 7,000 square feet. I don't know if that's true, but Sounds it's, right. it's like a, it looks like a resort, Carl. Yeah. Like, a, I don't know, 100, 125 unit condo building or 
a um, hotel, but there's eight units in there. I think the, some of the things we heard were things like sixteen million dollar US price tag. But we were there. Yeah, I imagine. actually googled it. Okay. Uh, so there was a I don't know. Someone had a sign at one of the beach properties on the beach, and it was luxuryrentals.com or something like that. And so I looked at their website, and they had a listing in there mm. for nineteen million. Mm. Yeah, it sounded right. Yeah. Yeah. Crazy, right? US. But amazing. Which isn't, yeah. Nuts. But all the beaches are, like I said, all the beaches are public in Barbados, yes. which is the right way to do it. So you and I can go sit on the beach at one Sandy Lane next to Riri and Oprah. Yeah. Hey, what's up, Oprah? <laughs> and you get a beach and you get a beach. We all get beaches. It's great, right? Like, it was thank pretty cool. You. Yeah. What was your favorite thing about Barbados? Uh, the people. We met some totally. awesome people. Mm-hmm. They just treated us so nice. We got invited over to people's houses for dinner. The Oyston's Fish Fry, we got invited out there a couple times to go for dinner. There was a farmer's market we went to one Sunday morning. It was inland. It was beautiful. Mm-hmm. Awesome people. Yeah, we had a great time. I really liked the rum bars. Oh, yeah. Because the food is amazing. They all have these little tiny kitchens with like three cooks back there. Yeah. And it's just homemade delicious food a lot of uh like fly fish mm. fly fish flying fish flying fish yeah uh, it's amazing a lot bread, of marlin right? they use yeah and then just like the best fried chicken yeah <laughs> it's amazing and they do this thing called macaroni pie that i've never oh, heard yeah. of yeah macaroni pie it's awesome it's literally just like macaroni cheese in a casserole with more cheese on top and it's <laughs> oh man everyone every little rum bar has them and they're so good you know who really has them? I mean, the rum bars are good, but those taxi stands where the taxi drivers pull over in the middle of the day to eat. Yeah. There's like a, uh, there'd be like a lady with um, a little mini putt putt truck and she yes. looks up the okay. back and there'd be, it'd be filled with chafing dishes, right? Yes. Like foiled chafing dishes. Yeah. And you just pull over and she'd say, you want pulled pork? Yeah, pulled pork. And do you want <laughs> macaroni pie? I'm like, yep, macaroni pie. <laughs> just keep going. Really awesome. I did a few of those. They park at the beach at the whatever from exactly. 12 to 2 or yeah, whatever. Exactly. And oh yeah, I did a couple of those. Yeah. So Super Barbados, good. Love it. I wish we could go back. It's awesome. That's a cool website they use actually that I'm going to look into. Homeshare? Homeexchange.com. Home Exchange. Okay. Yeah, I, I, there's many of them, but that's the one we've used. So we've uh, been members for almost 10 years and done four home exchanges. We're going on our fifth this summer, Finland. And uh, Helsinki, uh, where are we going? I can't remember my wife's. Again, my wife does it all. I just pay. <laughs> and it looks awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Um, I want to, so maybe let's start career-wise with Roots. Mm, sure. And the w- cool thing that I got from the uh, ha- the beginning of your Roots career was just that, like, I, I talk about networking as being such a valuable tool long term and just creating connections yeah. and being nice to people. Yeah. So, regardless of whether you're having a bad day or not, be nice to people, like the Barbados people, right? Mm. Just be friendly. Yeah. And you never know when that relationship or who you said hi to or introduce yourself to is going to work out for you. Totally agree. And it came similar, something like that, right? You met yep. someone. You were volunteering at Big Brother, uh, is that right? Yeah, so volunteering as well. Yeah. So that's a key for me. We do. I do a ton of volunteering still, but then I was volunteering. I was a big brother to a little guy named Taylor, and his mom's name was Lisa, and Lisa was really... This is kind of unusual and... Not unusual, but, you know, she was pretty well connected in the fashion and the media world in Toronto. So then they lived a very... They had a very, very kind of high, high lifestyle, like a big house and all that, so... I was his big brother and we would go do the similar big brother, little brother things, go to movies and stuff. And Lisa was a wonderful lady and she was always checking in with me like, how are you doing? And you know what? Cause she knew my wife was at chiropractic college and it was costing us a fortune. And she's like, what are you doing for work? And I had to tell her some of these jobs I had. And she was like, no, <laughs> you know, I think she was like watching out for me. And yeah. eventually she said, well, what do you like to do? And I was telling her about, well, I, I got a background in PR and public relations and I would sure like to get into marketing. She's like, oh, I know these guys, Michael and Don, they own Roots. They would love you. That's how she said it. She said, I'm going to a party. It was a, uh, uh, that's so old. It was a guy named Greg Gorman. He's a famous Canadian photographer and he was doing a, a Robbie Robertson photo like uh, exhibit. He'd just done all these photographs of Robbie Robertson and Matt Damon and Ben Affleck and, uh, Oh, Goodwill Hunting time. What was the girl's name from Goodwill Hunting? You know who I mean? Mini Driver. Okay. So he'd just done all these photos and he was opening his gallery. So she's like, come to the party. They'll be there. I'll introduce you. I was like, awesome. I didn't really know much, honestly. 
it was a bit embarrassing, but I didn't really know that much about roots. You know, I come from BC. I had some roots sweatshirts, but in Ontario, it was the shit, honestly. Really? Like it, okay. as a brand goes, it was huge. So in that time, in the mid nineties, they had about 140 stores across Canada with a large um, concentration of them in Southern Ontario. Okay. Cause that's where they live. That's where they're from. So yeah, she said, come to this party, went to the party, met them just like she said, hit it off. You know, we're great guys. And we'll talk, 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 talk. What do you want to do? And I sort of pitched them on an idea. You know, I'd love to do marketing for you guys, even though I had no clue what I was, <laughs> what a, what I was doing or B what I was getting myself into. They're like, yeah, come up to the head office. And on Monday, it was just like that. Come up to the head office on Monday. We'll figure something out. I was like, oh man, <laughs> awesome. Did you have any background in marketing? Uh, no, not really. What made you decide, oh, I want a marketing position? Just because I thought it would be fun. Yeah. I thought it was exciting. I'd done quite a bit of public relations. So I had done a lot of like uh, media interviews and events and speech writing and news release writing. So I had that part, which they also needed help with. Mm -hmm. But they really needed somebody to like, be their marketing director, like buy advertising, buy newspaper ads, design, not really design it. We had designers and stuff, but all that kind of stuff. Right. Mm. So that's what it was. Went up there, started working for them, reported direct, sort of directly to them and the CEO and did it almost um, in various forms, like a few different roles for almost eight years. And it was uh, like, it was stressful and amazing. Like, it's hard to describe. It was good, <laughs> but it was just, it was a hell of a job. Like lucky. I feel very lucky for sure. You had some pretty cool experiences at, in that company. Yeah. One of them being an Olympics trip. And was it 2002? Mm -hmm. w what city was that? Uh, it was Salt Lake City. Oh, Salt Lake. Yeah. What was that experience like? And, and what I guess what were you doing at Well, it was completely bonkers. Like the whole <laughs> scene was bonkers. And what's really weird about it is I wasn't really even supposed to be involved. In a way, because at that time I was already out here in BC, living in Vancouver with my wife. I was running their corporate wholesale office out here for Roots. So selling Roots swag, essentially selling like Roots sweatshirts to companies and movies with their logo on it, doing a little bit of PR and marketing for them, but not a ton. And it was just that they got down there to Salt Lake City and they were completely uh, overwhelmed, underprepared, overwhelmed like the response was just insanity were they selling down there they were selling down so they or were they, it was it more just like brand awareness or, no, no they had four okay. stores okay two in salt two or three in salt lake city and i think it was two salt lake city two park city utah park city is sort of like their whistler okay but closer it's about 40 minutes north of salt lake it's the it's where all the alpine events were okay bob slay downhill super g the whole thing right yeah, so they got down there and that, that was, I think, the one year, probably the one year where they were doing both Team Canada and Team USA. So like it was all on the line. So they were outfitting Team Canada, everything, the backwards beret was super hot. <laughs> Ross, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the owner of Roots, he's such a funny, he had this like, he does have this thick uh, Detroit accent and he called him Ras. So Ras was down there and backwards beret. And then the USA stuff, which nobody had a clue like weird you know the americans really didn't know what roots was and we designed all this stuff and we filled the stores with it team usa and it started selling like it was bonkers but that's what they weren't really ready for so these mat so anyways long story short i'm sitting in my office in vancouver on a monday morning the olympics opened on the friday night i'm sitting in my office phone rings answer the phone it's the ceo of roots marshall good friend of mine mentor everything wonderful guy rich you got to get down here. Can you be down here by tonight? I was like, yeah, probably. I mean, just let me make some, like, <laughs> make some calls. Didn't turn out that night. I got there the next morning. So yeah, made some calls, flew out of Seattle. And they just needed like extra bodies basically to help manage stores, manage security. They were just overwhelmed. And I had the greatest time. In fact, I disappeared for the first three days I was there. And I ended up causing a huge stink. But... I had fun. <laughs> That's all I can say is I had fun. A lot of it I don't even remember, but I know it was fun. I think I rem like obviously it's a long time ago now. It's yes. nine years ago, right? For for 2010 in Vancouver. Yeah, exactly. I was going to say a lot more nine years ago. It's a long. And so I think back to the Vancouver Olympics and just like how much fun this city was. Yeah. Every night. Yeah. And and honestly, the Olympics ended, and I was like, I need to do that again. Yeah. 
like when is the next Olympics and how do I get there kind of thing? Yeah. Cause it was so much fun. You're with people from all around the world. You're meeting a ton of people and everyone is just in a good mood all the time. Isn't it great? It was amazing. And I don't know if you knew that about Olympics. I, that, had, I had no idea. Go that there's actually like a, I don't know what to call it, like an alumni of Olympics event specialist, marketing people, branding people, and they just move around the world because they love it so much. Mm. Like they're not attached to roots or visa or Coca-Cola necessarily. They're more like attached to the Olympic movement uh, and that they just move around because they can't get enough of it. Right. Like every Olympics, uh, they're going to be working for the organizing committee because they just love it. Yeah. And it is addictive for sure. Oh, thank Can you. Can I refill your yeah, glass? Yeah, thank you. But I'll never forget, you know, I landed that Tuesday morning at the Salt Lake City Airport and Marshall, the CEO, he sent this guy named Dane, who's a great friend of mine. Shout out to Dane. <laughs> he sent Dane to the airport to pick me up in a rental SUV. And like, I walk out to the curb, curbside pickup, and I get into the truck and I say, hey, Dane, how you doing, buddy? I said, what are we doing today? <laughs> he goes, he just takes his hand. He had a really good hookup with NBC Sports. And he goes like this and he goes, this is what we're fucking doing. <laughs> And he's got like this mitt full of tickets. <laughs> and I, my eyes just bugged out. I'm like, what? And that was the start of it. Three days, we were just gone. Gone. Just every single awesome sporting events. Tragically hip concert. I mean, all this. It was just crazy. And eventually, Marshall, who's a, like a really good friend of mine, he calls me up and he says, I don't know who the fuck you think you are but you're supposed to be working here. <laughs> he says, if you don't get over here to the store right now, he says, you're gonna have to pay me back for this whole trip. Dane and I were staying at this amazing like villa basically up in Park City, a huge thing, two of us. And I was just adding it up in my head, the flight that I booked in a day, it cost a fortune. And then the, I'm like, yeah, I'll be right there. <laughs> I'm coming over right now. And then I just worked solid for the next 10 days and it was great. The, one of the other th cool things that you mentioned was, uh, you, <laughs> I don't even know how you, how it came up, but you were on QVC, yeah, which is a, a big national program yeah, and unprepared, right? You were just like the day before, a couple days before your yeah. CEO couldn't go. Yeah. I just went in cold. <laughs> yeah. QVC. It's amazing. You know what? I think QVC is pretty well known now for basically everyone in North America, a lot of it has to do with Shark Tank because on Shark Tank, Lori's on there, yeah. Lori's on there and they're constantly talking about QVC. But yeah, this was again about, uh, this was mid 2000s, uh, early 2000s. And yeah, Marshall, who was the CEO, he was sick and he called me in a panic. He's like, I'm supposed to be on QVC in two days. I can't go. I've got the worst flu ever. He said, you got to go. I was living here in Vancouver. I said, Sure. I, I didn't even know what it was first. I'm like, what are you talking about? And he sort of explained it. It's this home shopping network. And he didn't thankfully tell me the, how the breadth of it, how big it was. Cause I probably would have been scared out of my wits, but <laughs> you know, he said, you got to go. And I flew out from Vancouver. And the, one of the weirdest things about QVC is that they make you do a full day of what they call QVC university. I'm sure it's the same now. I'm sure it's still I was surprised when you said that I, I, looking back now, it makes sense to have some sort of knowledge of what you're supposed to be doing on camera rather than just showing up and being like, Hey, this is my product. Yeah. Uh, but that's super impressive. And I guess it makes the show a lot smoother, right? Oh yeah. And, and it, well, it makes what was a lot that training like, what are they well, talking about? It's nerve wracking yeah. in many ways because they're showing you all the, they show you around the sets and then you see all the it's all driven by stats. It's so buttoned down. Like they've got it just dialed right in. Yeah. There's huge screens right down on the floor that only yeah. you could see, the presenters can see. Call volume, sales volume, like real time stats. So you're freaking sweating bullets <laughs> when you're on there because you're like, shit. Like, and then they basically, they're telling you, one of the basic tenets of it is they teach you at QVCU, never disagree with the host. Because they've, they've studied it before and they see the metrics. If you, the hosts are so revered. And there's such audience affinity for those hosts that if you disagree with one, they they just see the call volume just plummets and the sales just tank. Interesting. So okay. it doesn't matter what the host says to you. So if I'm on with Lori and I've got my uh, spongy thing or whatever, yeah. and she says that it does this when I know it doesn't do that, I just say, yep, you're damn, <laughs> damn straight it does, right? So uh, it was fascinating. But I, I think I told you one of the funniest things about getting ready to go on in the green room. I mean, this is just, I found the whole thing kind of surreal, 
But in the green room, the guy going on before me has this thing called Celebridux, right? So this is how weird I am, right? So I'm listening. So I, I just say to him, because I want to uh, tell me about Celebridux. So he starts telling me about them. They're rubber duckies with the likeness of your favorite uh, sports athlete, athlete celebrity. <laughs> so I'm like, oh, really? Okay. And he said, well, I, I've got to sell out today. He's like, he's like, the pressure's on. I brought 10,000 of these with oh. me. So in my head, I'm thinking, oh, this is going to be tough, but I'll watch because he's on before me so I can see the whole thing. And one of the weirdest things is, so he's telling me about celebrities, sports likeness, your favorite celebrity. These were all MLB stars, major league baseball stars. Mm -hmm. So he had yellow ducks. <laughs> brown ducks and black ducks and i'm like i said what's the difference and i don't want to this is just what he said so it's not i'm not trying to be offensive he said if you're a white player you're a yellow duck and if you're a latino player you're a brown duck and if you're a black player you're a black duck and i looked at him i said and they agree to let you do this <laughs> and that's when he was offended this is how weird i that he got really offended he's like oh yeah because they had their names on the back and Delgado and their their number. And I'm like, they agree to this? He's like, oh, yeah, they love it. They get good royalties from them. I'm like, okay. Dude goes on. He's, he's on for uh, four minutes at like seven in the morning. And he sells 10,000 units sold out. Jeez. I was a believer that I'm like, okay, obviously I'm the idiot. I thought this was kind of weird, Celebridux, but no. Carl, can you can you Google right now if Celebrity Ducks is still in business? It's got to be a thing. It's still got to be a thing. And I want to see what the difference in the black and yellow ducks look like. Yeah, this no, no different. Same, like just uh, the bill was the same. the The baseball jersey was the same. Just, just different color. Just the name and the number on the back would be different. <laughs> I I thought it was weird, but anyways, we had a, I was there to pitch Roots stuff, Roots Olympic stuff. We sold a lot. We didn't sell out. Oh God! <laughs> See, they still exist. <laughs> so duck. But he's expanded into rap guys. Look Harry at that. Potter. There's a Harry Potter duck. Rastafarian. That is amazing. I I, I never will forget that the way I just you know because I can't. I, that's how weird I. I can't shut my mouth off sometimes, and I'm like, they let you do that. I think that would go through my head. Yeah. And like, oh, you'd... this is slightly racist. Yeah. But I don't know if I'd say it. So I'm <laughs> I'm proud. I'm glad that you did say it. <laughs> So you were you were selling Roots Olympic gear, Canadian yeah. Olympic gear? No, just U.S. stuff. U.S. Olympic gear. Yeah. And we and how we did, did we do? We did great. Good. We didn't sell out like celebrity ducks, but we did very very good. And I had a blast, and it was good. I felt proud because I didn't uh, I didn't disagree with the hosts, and I didn't say anything <laughs> offensive about celebrity ducks or anything else. I just stuck straight to that. I was like, I'm going to stick to the narrow here because I saw already he'd done so well, and I was like, shit. Yeah. I got to do good too. And yeah, we did, we did. And it was cute because it's like little old biddies, little old ladies. I imagine because you hear their voices over the speakers in the studio, right? And they're asking you, quite, you live interact with them. And Interesting. That's, okay. That's, I didn't know that. that. That's another layer of the pressure because if you don't, you know, like you can't offend the callers, you can't right. offend the hosts. This is hard for me to do because I'm offensive. Anyways, but no. That's a tough thing to do live though. Yeah. Especially for something like Celebrity Ducks, like oh, yeah. a sweatshirt that has a U.S. logo on it. it okay, that's easy, fairly chill, yeah. sell, right? But a black and a yellow duck. <laughs> but at least I made the little bitties laugh because I was doing things like teaching them how to say toque because they didn't, you know, I'm Canadian. So I didn't, you know. They say I'd, a hat, wool hat, right? Wool a knit hat. winter hat, knit, right? Knit that's hat. what they always say. So knit winter hat yeah. cap or knit winter hat. We call it a toque. And I'm like, can you repeat after me? And the little old lady's like, toque. <laughs> So it was great. They loved all that. That was great. So overall, awesome experience. If anybody uh, can develop a product, pitch it to QVC, pitch to Lori, get on with Lori, do it. You'll have such a blast. You'll sell tons. If Celebridux can do it. <laughs> <laughs> anybody can. Do you remember who your host was? No. <laughs> it wasn't Lori? No. Oh, no. Which, does she start QVC? Uh, no, I don't think so. It started a long time ago. I think it started in the 80s. Okay. So before her time. Actually. She's an investor or something like that. I, I think she's just a big a host of it. She's been a host. She has uh, a ton of products that are featured. That's what I think. But Gotcha. Okay. Uh, okay. Backtracking a little bit. Yes. Um, living in Ontario, still working at Roots mm. in, in the PR role. You mentioned moving to Vancouver. The story about how that came about, I think, is is very interesting. And it 
It started with a lunch with your uh, colleague, right? With Ken? Ken. The real Ken NG. We used to call him Ken. He's a great guy. Shout out to Ken Ng. Are you in touch with him still? Yep. Is is he still on the Roots brand? No. <laughs> no. He's doing his own thing now. Cool. But uh, it is a good segue to because it is about sort of, like, you know, you're in real, real estate sales. You're charting your own path and, you know, you, you eat what you kill, right? And for me, I wasn't in that role. I was still driving a desk. I still had the job. But... Ken and I went for lunch and I was sort of like kind of basically crying on his shoulder a little bit about, you know, woe is me. Look, at, I'm like crazy founders I'm working with and all this and crazy hours and the pay is not great. And I said, oh, how, how? I didn't really understand. I said, how's it going for you? What are you doing? What are you doing anyways at Roots? You got this beautiful new BMW and this awesome girlfriend, this amazing condo. <laughs> I was like, you must be doing something right. And he, and he sort of explained, like he laid it out. He's like, I do corporate wholesale. I, so I sell the Roots product to companies, Coca-Cola, Petrocan, Hollywood Productions. They want a thousand sweatshirts. I facilitate it. I take the order. I design it, make sure it gets into production, gets delivered. And he said, I make 10% commission for it. I'm like, oh, commission sales. Wow. Isn't that nerve wracking? He's like, no, not really. And I said, well, how much are you going to, like, how's your year going to be this year? He said, oh, I'll probably, I'll probably ship about 4 million bucks this year. I was like, what? It took a second. I'm like, oh, I was trying to do that. I'm never good at math. I'm like, 10% <laughs> is fourth 40,000 bucks. That's not very good. I'm like, no, Ken. I said, shit, dude, you're going to make 400 grand this year? He's like, yeah, probably. I'm like, holy shit. That is crazy. And that was it. Like right there, I was like, no, <laughs> I'm not doing... I'm going in a different direction. I have to, like, I have to try this. I think I could be really good at it. Yeah. So I just went in and and sat with the guys that own Roots and the CEO, my friend Marshall. And I said, look, love the company. My wife and I want to get out of Toronto. This is what I want to do. I want to go to Vancouver. I know you don't have anybody out there repping the brand. I'll open an office. I'll do a showroom. I'll pitch it to Hollywood Productions. I'll blah, 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 blah. And they they bought it. They're like, go do it. Blessing. They're like, uh-huh, go ahead, my son, and out I went. And uh, yeah, we moved out here, and it was awesome. How quick was that turnaround? I think we were gone within about... It also was perfectly... Like, the timing was... This is luck again, right? The luck. The My wife was graduating from a chiropractic college in the May, and we were here by July or August. I think we were here by August. So it just the timing was perfect. One of the big things that people talk to me or ask me about in real estate is, where do you start? Mm. How do you create leads? Like, how do you get, how do you get clients? What's your first move when you get a license here? I have a license to sell real estate. I know nothing about the industry. Where do I go? Yeah. Similar for you in sales. Yeah. You're moving out West to a different province that isn't really familiar with roots or the sales are a lot lower. You don't have someone out here. Yeah. What's the beginning look like? Beginning, it was okay. You know, um, it's a, it was a, it's a little bit apples and oranges because I did have that at the time the brand was really, really hot. So that helped open doors. So I can't give myself too much credit at the start, although I did work hard for sure. I worked hard, made a lot of calls, but the doors always opened. So that was good. I think the major difference is when I went out on my own and was then I was Patterson Brands and mm-hmm. nobody gave a shit. So that I think is like, that's, that's exactly where a lot of your viewers and listeners will be if they're in that new it's like nobody cares i'm sorry it's bad news but nobody cares Mm -hmm. and then you just have to make them care you have to appeal to them you have to give them value that's what i always try to do give people value so you're out here uh how long are you with roots when you're in vancouver about three three or four years about three or four years by 2004 a lot of things were happening all at once the brand was cooling off quite quickly they'd lost the olympic uh, connection. And, uh, yeah. And I had a ton of clients always asking me all through the years that I was selling their stuff corporate, they were saying, you know, we like the root stuff, but the line was very narrow. They were saying, if you could sell us mugs or storm tech jackets or pens, you know, we would give you the business because mm-hmm. we just like working with you, etc." So eventually I said to myself, yeah, it's time to go out on my own for sure. So you talk about that being your um, eye opening moment yeah. in terms of starting from scratch. Yeah. What was that first year like? And like, where did you even begin in terms of Patterson brands day one? 
Yeah, it was tough. I mean, yeah, I guess you had a little bit of advantage maybe in that you had built a bunch of connections in the industry. And I had a book of business. So that was lucky. That was like, I had a book of business. It was about transforming that book of business into the other stuff. Mm. But growing the business was tough. Yeah, because I didn't have that big brand name behind me anymore. Um, So I had to like prove to people that I had value to offer design Mm. chops or marketing skills or whatever it was that would set us apart. And I really do feel like that's what sets us apart from some of our competitors is just a, you know, our breadth of experience. We're not just salespeople, if you know what I mean. Like we've been there. Mm. I've, 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 I've had a, I think my biggest budget was I had a $24 million annual budget for marketing. So I had to spend that and understand it and do it right, et cetera, et cetera. So that really helps. What was the biggest struggle early on? What, was it just that you didn't have a brand name to kind of back you? I think the biggest struggle would have been that, what you said, not having a brand name and this not really knowing, not feeling like that, that sort of insecurity question, like what's the right thing to do? We're getting stuck in that question, like I have to do the right thing. I have to make the right next step. I have to do the right marketing move that'll make me get noticed. And that stuff, you waste a ton of time on that stuff. And I'd say to your listeners and your viewers not to get so caught up on what's right, just to keep moving. <laughs> That's definitely, you know, if you, once you stop moving, that's the worst. That is the worst. You need momentum. One thing I think about actually, now that you bring that up is, uh, a lot of er, young, uh, or new into their business entrepreneurs, uh, spend a lot of time on things that make like, don't matter at all. So things that people spend a lot of time on, and even we've been guilty of this. When I say we, uh, my partner and I, Jamie, um, business card design like little things that literally nobody gives a shit about right but you're spending four days designing a a business card that really we don't even use them very often because no one uses whatever it's like what's your email okay great i'll send you an email tomorrow so i found that a lot of people especially early in my career i found myself going into our office which we were with sutton group at the time going into the office and a lot of people were consumed, a lot of the other agents in the office were consumed by these menial things that I early on was lucky enough to see that that's not making me any money. Why am I spending four hours of my day designing this business card or editing the lighting on my photo that's going to be go on my business card? This is making no difference for me. Yeah. So I was lucky early on, but I, I, I do see a lot of people get obsessed with really small details that make no difference. Yeah. No, it's a great point. I think one of the greatest things, advantages you can do for yourself is to give, give value. You know, like what you're doing with this right here. This mm. is content and value that you're giving to people. It takes time out of your schedule, costs you time or money to set this all up and everything. And yeah. you're doing it really sort of out of the goodness of your heart, right? Like it's, it's something you're making available to people. And I think that's one of the greatest things that people can do is give value to people without any expectation Mm. and without a quid pro quo. Like, I don't expect to get business. Be nice if you do business with me. It's okay if you don't. Mm. You know, that kind of thing. Like right now, one thing I've been doing for years, and I highly recommend this to people for two reasons. One's selfish and the other is not selfish. But I have a subscription to something called HARO. Have you heard of HARO? No. It's called HELP, and it's an acronym for HELP A Reporter Out. Okay. So it's a subscription model you can belong to. It doesn't cost anything. And you, every day you get emails with like a summary of what reporters are asking to do stories on. Questions like, I want to do a story on men's health. I want to do a story on the current real estate climate and the best way to dress your house for sales. I'm doing marketing, whatever, right? And you read through the list and you can see opportunities for yourself as a small business person and to get free PR. It's great. So they just ask for something, you reply, and sometimes, and I've been using, I think I've been a subscriber for eight years. And I mean, I have got a ton of free press from it and big publications. Like, uh, I think the biggest ever was Washington Mm -hmm. Post. Washington Mm -hmm. Post put something on there. I responded. It was about our family, so that's okay. And it was nice. Like, I wanted, it was about Lunar New Year, and we have a, a little girl adopted from China. So it made, that's what they were asking. They said, we want to hear from people who've adopted from Or what do you do to recognize the Lunar New Year for adopted children from China? So I was like, I replied, Washington Post. And the weird thing about some of these things, like is the Washington Post, they interviewed us, sent a photographer out, 
and then it's part of the, uh, I think it's called the Associated Press, the AP. And then it went on the AP wire and the thing got picked up all across North America. So I had people contact me like family members and friends that I hadn't seen in forever in Denver and in Maine. And they're like, oh, I saw you in the paper. I'm like, you saw me in the paper? You read the Washington Post? They're like, no, no, it wasn't in the Washington Post. It was in the Denver Chronicle or something. I'm like, oh shit. <laughs> so you never know where these things go. So, but my other point is that when I read through this Haro thing, I'm constantly looking for my friends and my clients who they could get free press, not for me. So I send these things to them. Like I sent one to you and Jamie. I don't know if Jamie showed it to you. Jamie, bastard. <laughs> get on. He said he was going to. But yeah, I saw something. I can't even remember. It was like four or five weeks ago. Something about realtors. And I was like, this would be perfect for Jamie and Danny. So I sent it to, to, to him. I should have CC. I think I did CC you. Yeah. But that, that's I, yeah, the idea is like I, I look through and if I see something that I, because I would like it, you know, if they're going to, these reporters are going to interview somebody. They're going to do the interview. They're going to write the story mm. or do the, the television thing or the radio thing or whatever. And if it could be somebody I know who benefits from it, great. You know? A lo you mentioned, you talk about like giving value and podcast being one of the forms. A lot of people I find get into self-employment because it's glorified on social media. They think they're going to make a lot of money right away and they will avoid things or miss things if they don't see it as making them money in the short term. Whereas I'm looking more big picture. And part of the reason for the podcast is um, to give value to, I, I think my experience in the last five years of going from literally eating Mr. Noodles and craft dinner because I had no money to building this awesome, fun business with Jamie. I think there's a lot of value in my experience and the struggle and what it takes to overcome early on. Yeah. And it was not pretty. It was very ugly. Yeah. And I wish I was in it to Instagram five years ago because I really wish I could have going through the process, shown people what it was like because a lot of people don't get it. Mm -hmm. So one of the things is I, I want to share my experience. I want to share the experience of others. And I think there's so much value in showing people that I went through it and I'm still going through it in certain things. And so did everyone. So did you starting your brand and so did the other people starting their brand. It's not easy. Yeah. It's not like register your business name with uh, whoever you need to do with your, with your lawyer, start a company and paychecks just come, start coming in. Yeah. You got to work your ass off to get there. You got to. And for me as well, like it, it really, the podcast, it pushes me so much to network mm -hmm. and I've been finding so much value in just building relationships with people that I have never met before. A perfect example tonight. Yes, exactly. And, um, I think the networking and, thing is huge yeah. and I think people avoid it because of some weird, <clears throat> the weird thing comes up again because they're worried about being weird and it's, so am I, frankly, but I still do a ton of networking and it's really, really pays off. It's really great. You go to events, you meet people, you share what you're up to, not in a salesy type of schmarmy way, but you just share what you're up to and you listen to what people have to say and you share ideas with them and talk. And it always turns into stuff. I find it always turns into stuff, but staying home and staying sheltered and being scared and that depth, like it's like a lottery ticket, right? Like my dad always says, I really love this. My dad always says, you know, your chances when you buy a lottery ticket are only like in just tiny bit <laughs> better than if you hadn't bought one, but they're better. Yeah. And it's the same about networking. You have no idea what's going to happen. It might be a total wash. It might be a bust, but staying home and avoiding that kind of stuff, you definitely know that doesn't work. That's not going to win. That, that's not your ticket. Mm -hmm. Your ticket is going, showing up, just show up. And like you said, the podcast costs me money and time. Mm -hmm. I get nothing other than building relationships from it and sharing my experience. But what it, it makes me feel excited and it makes me feel really good when someone messaging me on Instagram saying, I listened to this episode. I learned this from you. Like, thanks for sharing. Keep it up kind of thing. Yeah. It just kind of keeps pushing you forward. And for me, I'm not so much worried about uh, short term and like maximizing profit today. I'm more interested in building relationships and the brand over the next 40 years. Sure. Which I think a lot of people get mixed up on when you get into 
your own self-employment. Well, I'm, sure, own I'm sure you find this all the time. You guys must talk about it in the real estate industry. I know we talk about it in our industry, my industry, like the custom merch and the swag. We talk about what we call like trunk slammers or people who are in it for the short term. Mm-hmm. And it's the most annoying thing because they have no scruples, values, integrity. It's all about the low ball chasing the dollar, just trying to chase the, just the cheapest they can mm-hmm. do it, which makes no sense. And I, I often say to clients, which they understand my client group, I have the best clients. They understand. I'm like, I'm in it for the long term. Like I'm not, I will still be here in 10 years. We'll mm-hmm. still be here in 15 years. And unfortunately it takes money to do that. Like it costs a certain mm-hmm. amount to operate a business. Right. And I just can't afford to sell it at X, Y, Z, like Joe Schmo, right? Because who knows what he'll be doing in five years or two years or five months. I have no idea. But, you know, that's the difference. You're in it for the long term. Like you said, we're in it for the long term too. One of the things that resonated a lot with me that you said in one of the emails that we were going back and forth on was uh, building trust with relationships is the reason that you're successful and the reason that um, your clientele sticks with you long term. My one of the questions I want to ask you is starting a new business. And I think this kind of goes back to networking and how to gain clients. But how do you build that trust early on with clients? You you say a lot of people come back to you um, for their next order and next order just because they find value in one, your company and the product, but also the relationship that you built and um, the value that you have together. How do you build the trust early on in a business? I think what you have to do, uh, I don't want to say unfortunately, because it's not unfortunate. It's just one of the things I think you have to do is you have to really, really go all out at the start. You have to go way above and beyond mm-hmm. under promise, over deliver. Um, and if you make mistakes, because we all make mistakes and it's, it's way easier to make mistakes when your trust bank is built up over, like I got some 20 mm-hmm. and 15 and 20 year clients. So the trust bank is so built up. It's like, if we screw something up, they're like, eh. Whatever, right? You know, they don't care. It's mm-hmm. like, you know, but at the start, shit, you know, so you really have to own it if you make a mistake, do what's right, make it right. So I think it's all above just all about going above and beyond at the start so that they get, so you can go like kind of that zero to 60 really, really fast. Zero to trust, if you know what I mean, like zero to trust mm-hmm. in three months, it can be done for sure. We do it all the time. Over, I think in any service or any business that has service involved, which is most businesses, but it's so important to never leave a client with a sour taste in their mouth. Yeah. So often there's things that w- in our business in real estate, there's things that we can't control. Yeah. When a buyer purchases a property and we ask in the contract for it to be prof- professionally cleaned as an example, yeah. and we get keys on the Saturday, March 1st or whatever, and it looks like shit. Yeah, right. It's not my fault. I wasn't in there. I'm not the seller. I didn't not get it cleaned. Yeah. But the buyer's pissed off. And who are they pissed off at? Yes, the seller a little bit. But they're also kind of pissed off at the realtors. Right, right. They think that we should have. So it cost me 250 bucks to clean a condo. Every single time I'm doing it because I want that person mm. to ha- to end the relationship. Not, not that we're ending a relationship, but end the transaction yeah. with a positive experience. It costs me money. It's out of my pocket, but it's just doing those little extra things that long term, the trust and in four years from now, when they go to sell that condo, they're ending that experience with such a positive thought in their head that they're calling us back. Right. Yeah. And I think what, what happens, and this happens to all of us, it's just human nature is that we'll want to approach a new business relationship, like with a wait and like a, if come type of imagination or a wait and see type of thing, like, uh, I'll just treat you like sort of like average or shitty until I know you're going to be a whale. And then when you're a whale, I'll roll out the red carpet. <laughs> then all the fun starts, champagne and caviar and yeah. limos. But uh, what I found really works is if you, uh, and it took me a long, it took some misfires to realize this is if you treat people right all the time from the initial meeting, because mm-hmm. you don't know where it's going to go then it'll really pay benefits. And you also have to give yourself the room to understand when you can say no to a client. Just you have to trust your gut. So sometimes you just have to say, no, we're not. I mean, I find this as a small business person. We just have a certain amount of capacity and then there's certain things we can't take on. Right. So I just try to use my gut. Like we're not going to take on every single person that comes to us because 
you know, we, we just can't, we're, we're, we're very fortunate. We're just too busy. Right. But, um, but if we are going to take somebody on, we're going to just service the hell out of them. Right. Like, so they can't believe it. One of the things I always say to <clears throat> potential clients is that like, I am always available no matter what to answer your questions. Someone, so I have a friend who showed a bunch of condos to, uh, I don't know, a year and a half ago, renting at the time. We offered on two or three. This was when the market was crazy in Vancouver. Uh, lost out on a couple. A week late, maybe this is after like three or four months of working together. His landlord says, calls him and says, uh, I'm putting the property up for sale. Uh, you know, you guys have been great tenants, but if we sell to someone who wants to move in, unfortunately you're gonna have to move out, just kind of prepping them. And we're going to be doing open houses, whatever, whatever. And so he calls me and he's like, should I buy this place? And I was like, well, what are they listening at? And he tells me the number and I was like, that's a great deal. Uh, you should try to not let it go to market. Cause I think it's going to multiple offers and go above that. And so he calls the guy and he's like, and I said, I don't care. Like, don't worry about me at all. I don't care. Call him yeah. right now and say, I'll give you that number. Can we do the deal off market? You don't want to have to pay a realtor. You won't have to pay a buyer's realtor. You'll save whatever, 12, 14 grand on the, on the commission. And I'll do it with you right now. And so he calls me back and he's like, you're not going to believe what happened, Denny. They said, yes. Oh, awesome. <laughs> and he's like, what do I do now? Yeah. <laughs> Cause like, it's just verbal. And so uh, I said, you have to go here to download these forms. No, well, right <laughs> so again, the, one of the things I'm getting at is think long term. Yeah. I'm making zero money from this deal. I spent three or four months working with them, spending oh, my time. Mm -hmm. And I said, I will send you a contract right now. Or I well, actually I met him for coffee. I said, let's meet. What, what time are you free today? And he's like, I don't know. I got off work at four. So I met him for coffee at four. I said, here's a contract. Uh, this is how you fill it out. This is what they need to sign. This is what blah, 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 blah. blah. Um, and I, I just faced, basically helped them through the deal. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. For nothing. Yeah. And it always comes back to you. Mm -hmm. I think, and not that I was really concerned about it ever coming back. It was more just like, this is the right thing to do. Sure. I'm not making any money from this deal, whatever. But again, leaving clients with the most positive thought mm -hmm. at the end of the experience. Yeah. And his sister called me today and his sister is working with a realtor that she's not very happy with right now. And she's like, this is the advice that they gave me. What are your thoughts? And I was like, Ooh, do you want my honest opinion? <laughs> She's like, that's yeah, why she was that's calling. why I called you. Yeah. I was like, ah, you know, I, and I gave her my thoughts and she's like, like, thank you so much. I know you're wasting time of your day. I know you guys are really busy. Thank you. Is that going to result in anything? I don't care. The point of it is leave people with great experiences at the end, treat them really well, regardless of whether it's financially beneficial to you or not. And long-term reputation is so much more important to me than a paycheck. Yeah. And I think that's what a lot of people early in their careers don't haven't learned yet or don't understand yeah. is that at the end of the day, reputation is what is going to keep you around yeah. rather than your buddy that you were talking about that five months from now is going to be oh, uh, yeah. shopping resumes around. But I, but you can understand why pe I, I really feel for people who are starting out now and, and these, like I was listening to CBC radio on the way over here and I had this story of this, uh, this young actor on this TV show called empire and he yep. faked his own beating. Right. And then you've got fire festival. So there's so yeah, much geez. fraud going on out there, social media, people faking it. I really feel for people now cause they're not really sure what's real. What's not real. What's the value in being real. What's the value not being real. Like if you can fake being president, can you, you know, <laughs> I, <laughs> I know this is not a political show, but you know, like if you can fake being president, you can probably do just about anything. So I really feel for people now wondering what's the, the right approach. But I think what we've been talking about doing it real, that's the, like, sure. You'll, you'll have those one-off things. Like maybe the dude could have pulled off fire festival. Maybe the empire actor could have made the thing work out with the beatings, but he probably shouldn't have paid the guys with a check. <laughs> that's, I know like that's sort of fraud one oh one. Do not write out a handwritten check because that's easy to trace. But uh, you know, those things are a bit of a shot in the dark. Um, but what we've been talking about, if you do it real, you treat people right. That'll, 
I think always work. That'll always work. I think long term it always works. I think short term mm. you're going to make sacrifices and 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 maybe that guy. You have to just make sure that you're not putting yourself against the guy next to you. So mm-hmm. in real estate, there are so many phenomenal people. Yeah. But there's a lot of people that don't know what they're doing and they're trying to make a paycheck today. And they're shady as shit, I imagine. That's like terrible. And maybe they cut their commission a thousand dollars and maybe they screw over their client and maybe they get one deal away from yeah. me or someone else. Yeah. Their reputation just goes in the drain and six months from now, two years from now, they don't have a job anymore. Yeah. Whereas But we, isn't that what always sorry to interrupt, but isn't that always what the real estate boards and what say about say a market like this where it's starting to possibly soften or it's mm-hmm. about to get quite soft it's like a correction right like it'll weed out the shitheads i imagine because there just won't be you know they're not able to do what they've been doing which is just write a few offers and screw around or whatever they've been doing i'm not sure mm-hmm. but it'll weed them out which in a way is a good thing you would think and I remember in the heat of the battle, I call it a battle. It was just like an insane market, 2016 and 17. Oh, trust in, me. I was there. I know. In 2017. Yeah. I remember your, one of your stories in 2017. Uh, one of my good friends says to me, he's like, when the market slows down, what do you think? Like what's going to happen to hmm. your team? What's going to happen to the number of deals? And I was like, honestly, I think we're going to like dominate. Mm-hmm. I think our market share is going to go up. And he's like, what does that mean? And I said, I think a lot of people that have got a real estate license in the last couple of years that are helping their family and friends, just because the market's so hot, sure, they look like a hero. Could they maybe have sold for an extra 20, 30, 40 grand with someone who marketed well and knew what they're doing? Maybe. Mm -hmm. Who knows? But they look like a hero because they had six offers Mm -hmm. and the market's just insane and the supply is very low. When the market softens and your places are on market for three, four, five months, you need someone that markets extremely well and understands how to talk to people as they're in the door and understands how to negotiate an offer properly so that you're not selling for 70 K below a list price. You're selling for 40. Mm -hmm. So I do think that again, it goes back to treating people well from the beginning, trust building trust and and a reputation in your industry, as well as a knowledge base that in slower periods are going to propel your business and, and not, I, I don't think it will slip. Yeah, yeah. We haven't really talked about Patterson brands in terms of Patterson group brands, brands, Patterson brands. Yeah. What do you, in terms of what you do? Sure. Love it. Love for the explanation. Well, great. I'm ready. to <laughs> get it. So we are essentially a small boutique marketing company and our marketing vehicle is custom merchandise. So we design and source all types of custom merchandise. Sometimes it's called swag. Really? I mean, it sounds fancy to say boutique marketing company, but really it's swag. So we're sourcing things like uniforms and apparel and mugs and caps and headwear and all that kind of stuff. And we're, we're designing it, sourcing it, applying logos and shipping it to our clients. And those clients are using it because they need to re- attract new clients or do staff retention, give thanks with a gift, a uh, gift with purchase take a new product launch out on the road, anything like that. And uh, we're very, very fortunate over the past uh, 20 years to have this amazing group of clients that essentially fall into, we really have three categories of clients, I always say. Hollywood North, big client for us. Mm-hmm. They buy a ton of stuff. Uh, high is that te- more like, uh, for Hollywood, because um, mm-hmm. I was curious when you said that, is that um, like crew wear? Mm-hmm. Is that what mostly it is? Yeah. Yeah. That's almost all of what it is. So, you know, Vancouver is either, depending on what source you read, is either the number two or three location in North America for production, Mm -hmm. probably behind New York City and LA. So we'd have a ton of productions here, movies, television, movie of the week, digital, and almost all of them have crews of between, uh, the digital's different, right? Because it's smaller, but... Traditional TV and movies will have crews between 250 and 800 to 1,000 people. And at the end of every production, they'll buy everybody a gift. It's just common knowledge. Common Mm. sense, I like to think of it as, but because we benefit from it's great. (laughs) And they will spend like, it's crazy what they'll, like they don't even question. You know, we, we want 800, you know, Arc'teryx jackets for the, we did Mission Impossible 4, Tom Cruise. I had to sign a waiver not to look Tom Cruise in the eye if I was on set. 
which is weird because I don't really even go to set, but I was happened to be in the office and they're like, you have to sign this waiver. If you see Tom Cruise, do not look him in the eye. I'm like, oh, fuck. Well, I mean, I'm six foot four. It would be weird if I look him in the eye because the dude is teeny tiny. But anyways, I digress. Hold on. What? Yeah. Why? I don't know. It's, is it's he either, self-conscious? Like It's either a uh, Scientology thing or a, oh, I don't... Sh- they didn't really specify and I didn't ask a lot of questions because I wanted to make the sale. <laughs> but it's either Scientology or he's in character or whatever it is but do not Weird. and you have to sign a waiver i promise to not look mr cruz in the eye <clears throat> anyways 800 beautiful art Terex jackets with mission impossible 4 logos it was really pricey i guess they just put that in their budget and say you know crew gifts x amount every it's all, per it's movie, all part whatever. of it it's all part of it so yeah that is a great great business and okay so you said you have three uh, yeah. hollywood north um, marketing and advertising agencies or event event management companies. I kind of all lump them into the same advertising agencies, marketing events. They spend a ton. And then high tech. High tech, obviously, mm-hmm. in Vancouver is awesome. Microsoft's a great client. Uh, is that like uniforms then for no, them? Or that, that'll more be client a, they're guess? probably one of the biggest breadth of uses. So they'll be using those products like uh, uh, cl- um, staff onboarding. So we do a lot of stuff for Microsoft where they're bringing new staff into the Vancouver office and they want to give everybody an XYZ. Gotcha. Okay. Um, Atomic Cartoons is an awesome client. Thank you, Trevor. He's a great guy. Uh, the owner of Atomic Cartoons, they've grown like crazy. So they do all sorts of cartooning and they've grown from when I first met them four years ago, they were like 60 people. I think they're over 700 now uh, in a downtown campus. It's awesome. So yeah, that, that type of that type of stuff. And there again, they're using it for uh, staff uniform, not uniforms, but staff, casual wear, athletic wear, gifts. Yeah. Cool. Um, okay. One of the things that uh, we kind of chatted about was like the idea of traditional marketing versus social marketing. Which one is more beneficial? What is better bang for your buck? And I guess the way I want to intro it is the company that you started, 9.10, yeah. was a social media market, a management company. Yeah. Maybe tell me a little bit about what you did and the early on days of, of 9.10 because... <laughs> You mentioned a couple of things that were pretty funny and just like walking into boardrooms and being like, this is our stuff and just being laughed. Oh, it at. was, it was outrageous. It yeah. sucked. It was terrible. What year was this? 2007, 2008. So this was, I was like, this was when Facebook was starting. Facebook was pretty early. Instagram was not around. Oh no, God, no. It, it, Twitter was just starting. Okay. Like I think I was, uh, I was within, I'm pretty sure I was within the first 100 Twitter users in Vancouver. Wow. Pa- at Patterson Brands, if you want to follow us. Uh, so, I mean, I was hooked right away. I was like, this is awesome. This is going to change marketing. And so my friend Adam and I, Adam K, uh, we were like, we got to start a company. Social media management. We'll like design handles and accounts for companies and we'll manage the content. Which, it sounds so dumb now because everybody does it. Uh, but at the time, it was like, what? You're going to do what? So we were going around to all these different companies, basically in the lower mainland, pitching this idea. Uh, we did a mortgage company. Oh, shit. What were they called? Because you'll know them for sure. Dominion Lending. Uh, yeah, they're probably the biggest mortgage yeah, company so in the world. Dominion and Lending. In, in, sorry. In I think Canada. the guy's name was, uh, he was a great guy. I'm sure he's still there, VP. And he was all for it. His partners were like, what? The same thing. Like, huh? this sounds dumb. But he was all for it. Uh, but yeah, we were getting literally laughed out of boardrooms. Like we'd do our whole pitch and, you know, we'll manage it. And then I had this background in PR and stuff like, so I was trying to kind of flex that muscle. Like, you know, we'll be able to capture your voice and translate it into content that'll make sense. But it was way too early. Like people just didn't give a shit. They didn't get it. You know, they just honestly didn't get it. So, uh, yeah, it was a tough, tough sell. Honestly, it was really tough. We were lucky to land one client i mean we landed a few clients i shouldn't make it sound so bleak but we did land a few about coca-cola was our biggest client during the olympics they did a ton here in the uh, van vancouver 2010 olympics and we ran that whole thing for them and it was great that was really good and then after that it's sort of just adam he wanted to do something different and move away with his girl and i was so busy selling lots of swag it was like 
which was an easy sell in a way, you know, it just, I was like, yeah, forget it. But now, shit, <laughs> to see digital now, I mean, I think I just saw this amazing thing on Bloomberg today that digital spending now outstrips all other advertising spending. I believe it. For sure. And they just announced that, like just in the last few weeks, the pendulum has swung. The total buy for digital spending now outweighs anything else, print, radio, TV, so. Talking about social media for your brand. Yeah. How much effort value do you put into your social media? Well, I still love doing it. So I really do it all. I run, even though we're a small company, we're only four people. So I do it all and I don't begrudge it. I love doing it. I, I think it's a... Uh, I think it's an amazing brand. It's so hard to say for different categories. I think really now it's become very f specialized for different categories. For example, I could launch a brand, a t-shirt brand, and I could do it all on social. You know, I could design a whole Shopify store, design it all on social, market it all on social, and that would drive sales. Now for us, I think it's different. For us as a B2B business, the social is more like a branding component, meaning uh, developing our our brand and our reputation or helping to solidify our brand and our reputation and giving people a sense of who we are. And that's how we use it. Is it going to drive sales? Not really. Uh, I'll give you an example. In 2010, I acquired, because I was really like just hammering it, I acquired 18 new clients, distinct clients on Twitter, met them on Twitter, developed a relationship on Twitter, engaged them on Twitter, and eventually not didn't close them, like didn't like make a sale on Twitter because I don't know how you do that. Like at, do you want to buy something? <laughs> but but basically the whole thing started because of Twitter. Uh, and I think that was possible in 2010 because the audience was quite narrow and the offerings were narrower. Just the whole, and the discussion was quieter, if you know what I mean. I don't mm -hmm. know if that makes sense, right? Yep. It just the noise wasn't there. Now... I don't know if you could do that. Maybe you could do that. Um, and, and I don't know if that would be valuable anymore. Cause, but, but at that time, it, it was pretty amazing. Like I was like, holy shit, this really works. You know, What platforms do you use most or do you find value in most for we're, your specific B2B yeah. environment? We're at Patterson Brands again. Patterson Brands on everything. We're on Insta, Facebook, uh, Twitter, uh, LinkedIn. We're the same handle on everything. That's really what we use. We don't use Pinterest. No Snapchat. So I try to stay away from the kind of, I don't, like, I don't really know anymore. I'm kind of on the outside looking in, so I don't really know what's, what's going to be hot and not, if you know what I mean. But mm. I find those ones really work well. We have to put content to Facebook. We have to put content to Insta. We have to do some Twitter stuff. Twitter's weird now, I find, because it's a lot of, like, political sniping and stuff like So it's. It's more difficult. What I find really good for Twitter is that we do have a like a really nice group in North America of industry colleagues that we keep in touch with through Twitter and we're able to exchange ideas mm -hmm. and all that kind of stuff. So that's great. I I don't use Twitter a ton, but from my limited knowledge of Twitter, it's more it's a time more time consuming platform because it's more of like an engagement in mm -hmm. terms of reading other people's tweets and commenting and engaging in conversation rather than Instagram is more providing value through posting mm -hmm. and other people consuming your content. Mm -hmm. Is that accurate? I think so. Again, I'm no expert, but I think I think that's pretty good. You're more like broadcasting with Instagram. Yeah. Image based, you're broadcasting images or short moving images, videos, etc. And on Twitter, you're definitely more engaging. You're talking about issues. And that's why I say I find it really good for keeping in touch with colleagues around North America. I don't find it that great for marketing. I do find a ton of political sniping, especially around New Westminster. I'm like, oh, God, I try to stay out of that shit because it's on there like crazy. People, Her Heritage Committee and all that kind of stuff. People calling shit oh, yeah. out. And I, yeah. like, for a few times, like I said stuff and I was like, oh, my God, this is nuts. People calling, hey, Rich, you can't say that. Like somebody, and I'm like, I don't even know who the fuck you are. How do you know who my name is? <laughs> and you're putting that in the tub. So I was like, I'm not talking about this anymore because I don't have time for it. You know, like, so yeah, there's a lot of, you, you know, you've lived around New West a long time. There's a lot of. Hard. What I really like about how exposing the internet is, is that you can't hide. Yeah. Every, so I think it is uh, like Gary V. Yeah, I love Gary. 
Gary V talks so much about um, in 35 years from now, all the assholes are going to be really uh, pissed off because their grandkids are going to be looking at what they put on social media yeah. and just being like, man, my grandpa's a shithead. You know, he's yeah, like, an, yeah. he's an asshole. Yeah. So it's almost like <clears throat> one, it's exposing bad people, yeah. which is good for society. Yeah. But two, it is almost pushing people to be better versions of themselves. Yeah which I think could be very beneficial. A lot of people look at social media as negative. It's, <clears throat> it's easy to bully on there and things like that, Yeah. but it's just exposing bad people. And in, in 30, 40, 50 years from now, that bully who is saying, you know, Sally, you're fat or what, you know, whatever their grandkids are going to look at them and be like, man, my grandma was an asshole. Yeah. Yeah. I got a funny Gary V story. Oh, I love Gary. Uh, he's, he's the best. So like I said, I was into this stuff early on, right? So he came to Vancouver, I think in 2008 or nine. And really? he, was at the, he was at the Vancouver <sighs> Convention Center, the new one. It must have just opened because yeah. it was before Olympics. And he was in like a, <clears throat> he was in a um, conference room sort of on the water side. Have you been in there? The big, beautiful yep. glass yeah, and yeah. the lovely wood and everything. And I bet you the, co- the room he was in had a hundred seats. And I was in one of them and I'm like, oh my God, this is awesome. And it was the most poignant part of the day. You know, it was, he gave his, his usual Gary Vee thing. He got up there, eh, fuck this and fuck that. And it was awesome. <laughs> and then he said he t- took some time. He wants to, uh, he always wants to interact with the crowd, right? And take real questions and offer value, the whole thing, right? And uh, some guy stood up and he put up his hand and Gary said, yeah, can, whatever. And the guy said, I came to Canada from mainland China I think he said I came here 18 months ago it got like real like right away you could tell the guy was hurting so it got real like the room got really like quiet like what the fuck's this guy gonna say right he's like I came from mainland China 18 months ago and he looked like he had the worries of the world on his shoulders right he said I bought a franchise for something called the coffee news do you know what the coffee news is yeah, it's the little one piece papers. You got it. Or two right? piece papers. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So everybody in the room, I guess, sort of, we were all like, oh, fuck yeah. I know what he's talking about. And he's like, and I bought this franchise and I cannot feed my family. He's like, it, it's not making any money. It's costing me a fortune to run this. Sorry, Coffee News, whatever. <laughs> At Patterson Brands. <laughs> I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Desmond Balkrishnan is my lawyer. You can contact him. But anyways, and this is not, these comments are nothing to do with Denny Dumas. Hey, it is what it is. Yeah. But this anyways, is something this, that someone else who exactly. was running the brand said. This is what he said. So he stood up. He said, I bought a coffee news franchise and I can't feed my family. And the room was just like, oh my God, this fucking sounds not good. And he's, this is 2009, right? So can I guess what he says? So the writing's on the wall. Basically, he says, what should I do? And Gary looked at him and he said, you got to get the fuck out of that arrangement. He said, there is no future in that. There's no future in like a little, he didn't even know, really know what it was. The guy had to say a little bit more about what it was, but everybody mm-hmm. in the room sure as hell knew, right? Cause we we're all like, Oh, <laughs> I'm not going to end well. He's like, you got to get out of that arrangement. There's no future in a little piece of paper pamphlet that's printed up and left on a coffee. He said, those audience, that audience is either gone or going i think i maybe this is bad sorry coffee news and if the owner because it's still around i know if the owner wants to come on the show i'd love to chat with you uh i think i use it as a napkin (laughs) when it when it's on the tables in a coffee shop (laughs) anyway sorry no i totally agree you're at tim's and you're like this this table's (laughs) disgusting (laughs) thank god i have a coffee news to hold my crawler while i sit here and chill so it was like i don't really remember much else about the gary thing i remember being lucky to be in the room 100 people i'm like this is great gary v and then this guy stood up and it was so poignant and anyway i didn't even say the whole part like he and he started crying the guy the guy started crying right there in front of gary and gary got down off the stage and hugged him and we're all like, oh man, like this is so real right now. So real. He's I'm a, glad he brought that up. He's a great guy. It's amazing. I, I love every second of it, right? And coffee news, sorry, but. Because one of the things I always, I've said from the very beginning is like, entrepreneurship is not, it's not as glorified as you see on social media. 
Like the day to day is a grind, is an absolute grind. Yeah. Today, even, I had this conversation with Jamie for like half an hour today. There's a lot of things in our business that we're trying to improve behind the scenes stuff. It's not like client interaction. It's not, mar- it's not the way we market. We feel like we've honed in and have a great pretty system dialed that way. In, pretty dialed in for sure. It's just like the behind the scenes systemized, systematized stuff that can make our team within our team a little bit more efficient, but it builds anxiety because there's so many things to do. Mm. And so like I'm, I'm on my computer at two o'clock and I'm like, I have an appointment in an hour. I have 78 things to do. It's going to take me two hours. It, it, it makes you anxious all the time. And I feel like there's that little knot in my stomach almost at all points in our like six month, really busy season. And so it, it's not as glamorous as people think it is. It's a shit ton of hard work. Mm-hmm. Like from, I, I'm not trying to brag. I'm just being realistic. But from February to probably the end of June, mid July, it's like 16 hour days. It's like Saturday, Sundays. It's you're like eating dinner at nine 30 and then working it again for three and a half, four hours Yep. and going to bed at two and waking up at six. Yeah. I do it every day. Yeah. My time, I always say my like eight, eight PM to 10 PM Netflix time. So it's like, I'm a multiple screen guy. So got Netflix going mm-hmm. and, uh, and, uh, I'm on QuickBooks online trying to like just catch up on the reconciling like because now it's february and year end I'm, I'm on a calendar year and so my year ends do pretty damn soon so i got to get these fucking bank records like done so i'm on their quickbooks and reconciling and that's fine i mean i don't begrudge it at all like that's a choice i made that is definitely a choice i made and i think we all make choices um you know but you pay a lot of taxes <laughs> that's one thing i always am <clears> like oh my god i pay so much taxes it's crazy how much tax oh, we pay. It's not fun. April, the end of April, Carl, is not not, not a fun time of year. Uh, okay, a couple mm-hmm. more just like quick things that I want to touch on. Uh, a couple of your blogs have some really good messages and I wanted to just kind of mention them and maybe you just touch on like the message and kind of what it means to you and what it's taught you. Um, one of them, adjust your route. I think it's called adjust your route for business. Oh, my football career. Yes. Oh, shit. And so you gave, you gave me a story and, and you mentioned this story, <laughs> but I think it's so valuable. And one thing that I, I think I heard in a podcast recently was your goals never change when you're an entrepreneur, or when you're like super motivated, but the plan to get there will. And so that, that kind of quote kind of relayed back to your story of like, you have these roots. Oh, that one didn't work. Okay. Well, this is my goal. Okay. Let's try this one. Oh, well that one didn't work. So let's go up here, you know, kind of thing. Yeah. Your plans will change and yeah. you'll adjust your business accordingly. But the goal, yeah. the outcome that you're trying to get to never does. And I kind of bring that back to your adjust your route for business success. Yeah. And and the other point about that, that blog post was that you're really on, I didn't want to make it sound too bleak, but you're on your own. Yeah, And you have to be self-reliant. And that's one thing I find with young people now. I mean, I don't want to harp about millennials and all this shit because it's, it's overdone and it really doesn't matter because when I was 22 years old, starting my career, the old people harped on us too. And it wasn't about millennials because that didn't exist, right? They didn't, that tag didn't (laughs) exist, right? But it was the same shit. It was like, oh, fuck, you don't understand and all that. But still, it's worth saying that I, I really want young people to understand or be not understand because that sounds so patronizing but i want them to feel confident and buoyed by the idea that you have to be self-reliant and that was the point about that post was that i was a dummy on the fucking football field like a dummy i didn't know what i was doing (laughs) and here i am the 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 coach pencil that was our receiver coach he's like patterson you're the designated on this route and i go out to do the route and I, I, I thought I executed it perfectly. I did my little eight <laughs> steps and I turned out and no, no ball was thrown to me. And then I got all confused. I'm like, why didn't the ball come to me? And I'm running, I'm still running full tilt. You know, I'm six foot four. So when you run full tilt, you like, you have quite a stride. <laughs> and it only took, I think, me two or three strides. And I was in, like I'd passed the edge of the field, <laughs> which I figured, I felt, the, I'm like, I think that's the edge of the field. And then I'm in the forest <laughs> at the edge of the field because there was no like, there was no fence or no edges or no nothing. Just boom, I'm in the forest. And I mean, my teammates 
it was called the Vancouver Marilomas at the time. They fucking <laughs> lost it. Because here I am coming out of the bush with like twigs and shit in my face mask. And the coach is freaking out. He's like, Peterson, what the hell are you doing? He didn't even get my name right because it was like an, such an idiot. And that was the idea. Is like, dummy, why didn't I stop? Like, it didn't have to keep going. I saw the ball go to the other receiver. Like, duh. That was, that's my point is that you're out there on your own. You have to be able to adjust. You have to be able to figure shit out on your own because that's the most frustrating thing as a small business person. You might find this because you've got a team Mm -hmm. working with the team is like, I don't want to hold your hand for every single thing or else I could just do it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I just figure it out. It's not rocket science. And it's okay if you make a mistake, it's better that you try it and make a mistake, fail than if I have to walk you through every step and hold your hand. And I mean, that was one of the greatest things I ever got with the whole roots experience, which was, like I said, an awesome experience was that they didn't, they were like, just do it. Mm. We don't give a shit. Just do it. Don't care. You know, I'm worried. I don't have experience. Just do it. It's funny that you end on that because, um, that was the other thing in terms of the blog. One of the blogs I read, the message in it was like, you've been over your head so many times and you figured out that you just have to figure it out. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And I bring that back to something I say all the time is that like, I like that I'm at a position in my business and personal life now where I'm in control and if something goes wrong, it's my, it's not, it's my fault. Yeah. It's not someone else's fault. If, if a client has a bad experience with our business, it's my fault. It's my fault that regardless of whether they're working with me or another realtor, I didn't train that realtor well enough. I didn't put in the extra time to reply to that email so that they, you know, their experience is low, you know, whatever it is, Mm -hmm. it's my fault. Mm -hmm. And it's almost very freeing to think like that. Cause you hear all the time when you're at social situations that, Oh, you know, my, you know, my coworker is an idiot or my boss is an asshole and that's why I'm not moving up the ladder and all this stuff. But mm-hmm. it's a pretty cool idea in your head to understand that I'm in control of my life. Yeah. And if something bad happens, it's because I didn't address it well enough or didn't perform well enough. And I can learn from that and get better and not make that mistake again. Yeah. And so that is something that sticks out to me. And that's something that I'm pretty passionate about is just that no matter what happens, I'm in control and that's my fault. And it goes back to the Gary V quote. This is my favorite Gary V quote, Carl. We're ready. Oh, the build up. <laughs> Hit it. It's you made your bed, fucking sleep in it. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's so, I think about it all the time, yeah. all the time. I'm in control. I'm making decisions throughout my life. If I don't do them well enough and something bad happens, it's because I didn't do it well enough or I wasn't educated enough or I didn't spend enough time practicing or doing it Mm -hmm. and it's just so freeing to me my wife and i were watching something on tv the other night escapes me what it was but they were talking about people's careers and experiences of work and how people will go like 10 15 20 years in a job they hate (laughs) and i looked at shannon she's a chiropractor she's got a very busy practice and she sees i mean i don't know how to say it but many of her patients are not in good health and have a lot of concerns. And I said to her, do you really think that people go through life like that? Hating that? She's like, Oh shit. Yeah. Mm. She's like, I see it all the time. People hate their jobs. Unhappy. And it's, it's hard to relate now in a way because I've been doing this on my own for so long and I love what I do. I mean, I just love it. Like every day is like, ah, I can't wait to try out some other crazy thing or marketing idea or work with these amazing clients. I got these amazing clients, but yeah, I forget sometimes that some people just hate their jobs, just hate it. Yeah. And I had a job like that. So I shouldn't be so uh, unempathetic because I had one like that where I like hated going all the time and thank God it only, I extricated myself after six months, but I did have a job where I hated, hated it. And it was torture. Six months? Six months, yeah. It's exactly like me. Yeah. <laughs> I, so I'll just like quickly recap because I think it's interesting. Is I work for my dad right out of university. He Sorry, sports dad. bars. <laughs> Sorry, dad. No, no, this is not the job oh, okay, I hated. Okay. This is not the job I hated. It wasn't, it wasn't like something I could see myself in long term, but I yeah. had fun doing it. It was bartending. Yeah. It was fun. You're, it's very social. 
uh, you learn a lot too. You mm-hmm. learn how to talk to people, mm-hmm. which is you super probably saw weird. the unhappy people, right? Like they're lots, out there. Yeah. lots, yeah. But um, after that, so my dad lost his businesses. I was kind of struggling, and I was like, oh, I need something. And I had a connection at a bank, and I took a job at a bank, mm. and I worked for my dad for six years. Called in six zero times. Mm. Went to sick. Went to work sick. Off, to, like not feeling well. Go to work. Just do it and get yeah. out of there. Go to bed. Called. I worked at the bank for five months. Hmm. Called in sick six times because I did not want to be there. Yeah, it was so brutally painful, and that's what pushed me into real estate. Actually, yeah. which was great. Is I, I always thought about it, but I was at this at this job that I, I literally just couldn't get out of bed to go to. And so I was like, I have to make it, I have to do something different. I've and been I, there. I've I been quit there. the job before yeah. I even got my license, before I wrote the exam in real estate. Yeah. It's just like, I have to pass this exam. If I don't, I'm screwed, but I, I can't be here anymore. Yeah. I've been there. Here's yeah, yeah. the, here's how it manifested when it was for me. And tell me if this is something that happened to you. Well, you would call in sick. But I would actually like be, so it was in Toronto. This is before I met the Roots Boys. It'd be in Toronto. First job I had, federal government, PR guy. Terrible job working with horrible people. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, sorry, sorry people. Maybe I was, I was horrible. I don't know, but it was, just wasn't for me. And I'd be, I'd be standing on the subway platform in the morning, TTC in Toronto, waiting to go down to the office. And I'd be wishing that something would happen. So it would be okay if I got maimed. I didn't want to die. Like it wasn't that bad. I didn't want to die. I wanted to live. But if I got maimed, I'd be like, that's okay. If something happens, like a crash and the cars come off the tracks and I get like smoked and, you know, I get a broken leg. Awesome. <laughs> and I remember going home telling Shanna, my wife, we were, married, we were just kind of newly married at the time. And I told her this and she's like, <laughs> you got to get out of there, dude. <laughs> like, this is not good. If you're wishing to be hurt on your way to work, I was like, yeah, you're right. So that was it. Six months. Soon as the six month contract was over, out of there, gone. That's so yeah. funny. Uh, I wanted to mention something quickly. Yes. You did a, I don't know if you call it a contest or, you know, whatever, level up your brand mm. and you're doing it again. There you go. Mm. There you go. Uh, and you're doing it again, like uh, in the next year or so. Yeah. Hopefully. Um, can you just explain to people what that was? Cause I think that's a really cool concept in the, in terms of like one giving back to yeah. young entrepreneur business people, yeah. but two, it's a great networking and, and I think a really cool local idea because now we're seeing it mainstream with shark tank and, yeah, and yeah. dragon's den. So that's, that's, it's exact, uh, the genesis of it, I'll share with you. The genesis was I was sitting with my good friends, Matt and Catherine, their new West residents, their company's called Web Design. Okay. Uh, they're not web designers. Their just last name is Web, W-E-B-B. <laughs> and they do graphic design and they do do website design, but mostly they're like packaging designers. Anyways, we're sitting having beers and we're sort of talking about, oh, New West, such a, it's been such a good community to us because we're both, we're all sort of new to New West. And it'd be nice if we could give back somehow. And we're kind of like, just over beers like how could what could we do exactly and i don't even know how the idea who said it but somebody's like you know what if we ran a we did like a brand makeover what if we did a brand makeover and people applied for it like a contest and somebody won and then they won a package of stuff like we could do like they would get a whole new logo makeover and they would get a bunch of swag from patterson brands and they would i was like that is an awesome idea so that's how it, that's how it started so this would have been like <clears throat> early late 2017 and we had it ready to launch by early 2018 and that's exactly what we did we designed this contest twelve thousand dollar package of goods and services uh steel and oak threw some beer in and um big star sandwiches through sandwiches because we wanted to have like a party at the end so you would win a party for your staff clint sent you an email today clint you're coming on the show buddy oh yeah i just had coffee with him he's got well, I won't say it. He's got something to talk about. Yes. He's got something new. And Clint. I, first of all, I love Big Star. And yeah. as soon as I, I don't, I can't, I don't know how long it's been around, but like big fan of Big Star. Oh, awesome. And at one point they had a, a shop on 12th. I think that was their mm. first store. Yeah. Where and we had an office. Time at, is now. Yes. Yeah. And we had an office at Steel and Oak and I was probably there four days a week. Hmm. 
and it was packed. There, there would be lineups out the door. Yeah. I'm like, you could, uh, these guys got to get a bigger shop. And then like six months later, they moved down to Columbia to like three times the space. And I was like, oh, yeah, it makes oh, sense. The sandwiches are awesome. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Amazing. But yeah, Clint, great guy. So so it was a package, 12,000 bucks worth of stuff. There was advertising from um, the New West Record, $2,000 or $2,500 worth, 2,500 bucks worth of swag from my company. $2,500 worth of, uh, of uh, logo redesign and, and branding from web. And um, John at Canarap did another like 20, everybody was doing basically 2,500 bucks. So it was really, really nice. Cool. And we had 35 really awesome organizations apply. And was it, how, how did you market to other businesses in terms of like applying to the show? To the, I think we put it out on Facebook. We put it out on Twitter. It's a lot of social stuff. Was it all local? Yeah, you had to be a local, uh, you had to be New Westminster. New West. Okay. Yeah, New West based. Uh, I can't remember all the stipulations, but it was open to nonprofits and for profits. Actually, I think it was pretty wide open, if I remember right. I mean, like I said, my memory, but it, it was a, uh, you could be big, you could be small, you could be old, you could be new, you could be nonprofit or for profit. And we had a real breadth of organizations, but you basically, it was merit based. So you had to, dis- you had to, um, you had to describe a need. Right. So steel and oak, it would have been weird for them to apply mm-hmm. and it would, the merit, like would they need a brand makeover? No. Right. So most of the organizations that were applying, it made sense for them. Like sure. when you read their application, you're like, I can see they made a really good case for why yeah. they were at a certain stage. Either it was because they were new or maybe it was because they were old and they needed a refresh like that. And so there was a judging panel and that judging panel took the 35 submissions and shortlisted it to three. And then we did it dragon's den style we had a live event and all three came to that plus there was about 60 or 70 people in the crowd and they pitched basically did a live pitch and stefania at mindful mutts was one of the finalists we know her fairly well yeah if you had her on uh i haven't but she would actually be a great oh, person to talk to awesome she guest. she was involved in real estate for a long time i don't That's know if right. she is anymore no, no i don't think she is anymore no because she worked for uh at Remax, she told me she was at Re- the Remax Advantage yeah. office in uh, New West. She yep. is a, such an interesting character, and she always she she probably will say no. She doesn't want to be on. She'll be all nervous. But what I always find with her, and I call her on, is I say, Stefania, you always downplay like your ability, and mm-hmm. you're very shy. And, but then she just goes out and friggin' slays it. And that's exactly what happened at the level up my brand thing. She was like, I'm nervous. I'm not sure how I'll do. And then she went out on stage and killed it. And it was, I think it was virtually unanimous. There was like a seven person judging panel and they're like, yeah, she won. And uh, she wrote me an email. This is beautiful email a couple weeks ago about what a difference it's made for her and how she wants to be involved in the 2019 version. So we are going to do another version. And we just sort of waited a bit because it took a lot to organize it. And, you know, New West is a small community. So it's, are you going to do it every year? You might get a lot of the same applicants, if you know what I mean. So we're sort of shooting for that. 18th to 18 to 24 month window before we reboot it basically. Yeah. So there will be another one. Are you, is the plan to keep it new S based? Possibly not. I'd like to I see it go. I think it'd be cool to go bigger scale. Yeah. yeah I I was, so. so I've been pitching that around to some of the, cause it's not all about, it's not about me. I'm not, the, you know, not my thing. I, I don't want it to be my thing. I don't want to own it, but I've been saying to some of the other partners of all, I said, what if we make it like a tri cities thing? Mm-hmm. You know, what if it's Port Moody, New West Burnaby or Port New- Moody, New West Coquitlam, then you just start to go broader, right? You can make maybe a little bit better, not better, but a b- bigger prize package and you can just reach more people. Mm-hmm. So to- in terms of like getting people involved in um, like the prize package and having a lot more applicants and better, maybe higher end quality applicants, I think that'd be a cool idea. Yeah. You just reach so much more people if you, because New West is such a small city. It is very small. It's what, 80,000 80, residents yeah. or something like that. The way that I like ending mm. podcasts is asking people to make a final statement. But with you and your background, I almost want it to be um, maybe like top, th- you pick two, three, four um, points for branding. Mm hmm. Whether it's a service-based company, it doesn't have to be specific, or you can be very specific if you want and yep. say, if you have a clothing company or a, a, a product company, these are the three things you need to focus on. Yeah. I think one of the biggest things I've been a proponent of in the last <laughs> 20 years, 
but really even more so lately because there's such a focus on digital. And I think digital is important. I don't think people should turn their back on social selling, uh, digital advertising, Facebook ads. You should have that. We definitely do in our small company. That's a component of it. But where I really see people, for, what I see people forgetting to do is to make it personal. Like, what are you going to do? What are you going to send to people? What are you going to give as a gift? What's tangible that you can, because a funnel, a funnel click system or a thing that builds your newsletter list is very impersonal. And you can work really hard on developing the most amazing newsletter and send it out. And you pretty much, if you can hit the standard open rates, industry open rates and response rates, you'll do well, but it's still really impersonal. So what's that next step that you're going to do to engage with your audience and build a connection? And that's where I really feel like our company shines. Like we do it for ourselves and we do it for, for clients. And, uh, you know, we do, I find we do it so well sometimes that we send things out as gifts to clients. Like I gave you a gift tonight. We've sent that out to clients and they get it and they open it and then they go, oh shit, I'll take a thousand of this with my company logo on it. I'm like, really? (laughs) So it's like that kind of connection where they see the value right away. And I wish that for, I want that for other small business people to have be able to make that connection with their audiences. Send a gift, write a handwritten note. That is a lost art now, a handwritten note. You know, express yourself in writing. I think that is lost on people. And it's okay because it's not really taught so much anymore and that's okay too. But get yourself an app called Hemingway app. I have it. Hemingway app, put it on your desktop. It'll turn you into the most brilliant writer ever. You can write out your clunky email and then you copy it into Hemingway and it tells you everything that's wrong with it, all the (laughs) grammatical mistakes, all the typos, all the spelling. And you're like, oh shit, this sounds awesome once it's gone through that app. So I really encourage people to not miss that, the missing link there. How are you going to connect with people on a real level? What are you going to give them tangibly that they'll remember you by Mm. and have you know, a really good affinity for you and your brand. Like, oh, I remember that guy. I've got this thing sitting on my desk that he sent me, a personal note, a picture frame with a picture in it, signed. You know, I'm not sure, you know, it's all, who knows what it's going to be. It's not about what the thing is. It's about the intention behind it. I think, so the way that I look at social marketing versus tangible items like that is, Return, uh, you always talk about ROA, but ROI is very difficult to track with social and internet marketing, but where's the attention? And so giving out one item I see as a, a narrow audience and maybe, maybe the return is greater, but social just has such a broad audience for such a small cost. And so I think in terms of like, maybe having more people come to you social advertising is is such a phenomenal tool that i think is still very underrated and mm-hmm. underpriced mm-hmm. but i think there's so much value in being more personal it takes more time more effort and often more money mm-hmm. to do personal items like with our real estate business and i think you'll probably like this cuz this is along the lines of giving something some giving someone something very tangible is anyone that's done a deal with us in in that calendar year we deliver gifts to on Christmas. So I was talking about the mugs and toques and just like little cool, funky items. And often we throw beer in there because we have a very good relationship with Steel and Oak. Uh, People love it. Mm. And so it's not so much a return in terms of social is more advertising to get people to come to you immediately, Mm -hmm. right? Or soon. Whereas those gifts are often long-term relationships, right? The stuff we were talking about much earlier, the long game, right? It's all about the long game, that stuff. Yeah. And events. I can't, I can't underscore how much doing events and welcoming your clients to come to things, Mm -hmm. like take them to something. You know, we've taken our clients for so many seasons now to the Vancouver Canadians. We get like 25 or 30 seats in just the regular grandstand. Although, sorry, Canadians, they do have this awesome like corporate 
Have you been to their beer thing? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, it's awesome. Like, I used to work in the beer industry. So we, oh, yeah. and I think Granville Island, they did run that little yeah. tent area. I don't That's know if right. they still do. I don't but, know either. So yeah, yeah. So you can go to that. The tickets are a little bit more expensive, but honestly, we found that our clients just love going to the general grandstand. The mm. tickets are like 14 bucks each. So, mm. and they love it. And we give them like beer tickets. So tickets to go get beers and tickets to go get food. It doesn't cost us a lot. And the, the return, like you say, they're just, they're just like, oh man, I had the greatest time today. And they bring their kids. And so those kind of things, you spend a little bit out of pocket, but mm. people love it. Even that's something we did with, uh, just building like a company culture. And when mm-hmm. you have, it's easy to do when you have a smaller company. Mm-hmm. So we have eight people on, in our team right now and we did a Canadians game this year and it was so much fun, right? Mm-hmm. Go, We went and got, grabbed a beer before at a local bar and then walked over the stadium. Yeah. And it, not that you even watch much of the game, but it's more just like being in the sunshine and being social. Yeah. And it's totally. Did you go to Shays on main street before? Shays is really good. We went, to, we went to a little bar on Main and 33rd ish, yeah. but yeah. I, it wasn't Shay. It was okay. different. One. Anyway. Um, but yeah, for in terms of like an in house event, so much fun too, mm-hmm. but very cool client event mm-hmm. idea too. Mm-hmm. Love it. Rich, thanks so much for coming on. Oh, it was it was a blast. That was a lot of fun. Great to officially meet. Thank you. I know we've been back and forth emailing wise. I know Steel and Oak has had a long relationship with you. I know Jamie has as well. Yeah, no, Steel and Oak, awesome partners, Jamie and Jordan. Fantastic. For it's sure. So fun. Uh, marketing branding questions, feel free to hit up Rich on Instagram at Patterson Brands. Uh, as always, guys, I'd love to hear feedback. Hit me up on Instagram, Benny.uma. Good night.